Don't worry, you can spray Mark. You won't mind. <laughs> well, actually, it may be on camera right now. They may have like can be. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, actually, it's sometimes it's different when they show on the screen. It's one of those. Just turn to me. I take the little man cake and I put it I have allergies too, but I still feel like sick, except for feeling like I'm sick. Yeah, well, my husband is prone to sinus infections. Those can be. They can. If you don't, if you don't jump on them. All right. <laughs> Okay, we are now ready to begin our work session on the Community Energy Plan update. I know that this has been an eagerly anticipated uh, work session on our schedule for a lot of different reasons. Uh, many people know about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and raising to uh, wide public consciousness the uh, importance of energy policy when it comes to combating global climate change. We know that Energy is the principal component of global greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore what we do on our very localized level very much impacts the, the broader world around us. But of course, uh, we care about sustainability, not just because of climate change, it's because we're Arlington. It's long been in our DNA and our ethos to be a sustainable community. Uh, we, we have long uh, wanted to be a leader in this regard because doing our part is important. Also, it improves the well-being of people in our locality. It helps our community develop a degree of resiliency, not just to the growing threats caused by climate change, but to the nature life in general. It can provide an economic stimulus when it comes to green jobs. And I know some of us come at it with a whole idea of energy policy leading to broader equity in our community. So lots of different reasons to really engage uh, in this subject and, and this update to the community energy plan uh, brings with it a dramatic sea change in the way uh, energy is distributed, generated, distributed, uh, lots of good stuff for us to wrap our heads around evolutions in the sector and figuring out what's going to be our vision over the next five years. How are we going to look at our trajectory in light of all of these various factors? So we've got this daunting task of 
working through a document which is designed to really serve two purposes, to not only be our vision, create our North Star for where we're going, but also for our staff, the work plan by which they will be judged according to their success in leading us towards these key things. So it's not just a matter of being aspirational, it's also coming up with a functional work plan that we are gonna, kidding, we're not just gonna hold our staff accountable for it, we're gonna hold all of ourselves accountable for it. So we've got this aspirational North Star, but also something that is grounded in uh, the reality that we can hold ourselves accountable to. Our community energy plan has to do all of that. So we look forward to hearing uh, what has been developed thus far, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Schwartz. Thank you, uh, Chair Dorsey and members of the board. Uh, before we go into the presentation, I just wanted to take a minute to thank Shannon and Demetra and Rich and Greg, and I, I'm not gonna be able to thank everybody, but John and Joan and everybody who's worked on this to date, a lot of hard work has gone into it. There are three questions I think we're gonna try to wrestle with today. The one or zero question, that's should we have a target of, uh, for our carbon emission goal when it comes to uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalents? Um, what should our target be? And then also, what are our goals for county government and countywide? And then a uh, third conversation on energy equity. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to Demetra and Rich, who will be your tour guides. And thank you, and Ms. McBride, before you begin, colleagues, I think it'd be best since uh, staff has really got a coordinated presentation for us if we could hold our questions until they conclude. Uh, so just jot them down as they're going, and I'm sure we'll have enough time to answer anything, but let's get through the, the presentation so that it all comes together and makes sense. Thank you. We're looking forward to your questions and guidance, so I'll be very brief. But before Rich Julie takes us through the overview presentation, a short note for the public who may be asking why a community energy plan. And um, Chair Dorsey, you and I must have been channeling each other on, on the approach because the short answer is that Arlington County is a magnet. It's a competitive subregion vibrating with achievement and purpose. 70% of its population is concentrated in working age groups. The county has over 42 million square feet of rental building area. This also includes more private office space than the downtowns of Denver, Atlanta, or Los Angeles. And the commercial vacancy rates have dropped 4% or more only since the adoption of the original CEP in 2013. The county is home to thriving retail centers and a strong, significant, high-tech, data-driven, and expanding business community. Over 23 million passengers flow through National Airport each year. There are over 200,000 passenger and commercial fleet vehicles registered in the county, and nearly 45% of the weekly commuter trips are from single occupancy cars. But also in addition, it's estimated that there are at least 100,000 daily pass-through commuter trips originating outside the county. And by 2045, Arlington County will have a projected population of more than 300,000 and host approximately 270,000 jobs. All this activity, growth, and productivity. And it's all driven in great part by energy, the production of which has also historically driven the greatest increases in greenhouse gas emissions. However, science, technological advances, design innovations, mass affordability of renewable energy, smart grid, traffic management and electrification, new financing frameworks and new utility models. These developments and more offer us the tools for reliable clean energy and high performance energy efficiency, all while we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions footprint. The Department of Environmental Services and the county's tireless, talented AIR team are pleased to bring to Chair Dorsey and the board this review of the draft 2019 CEP. We later welcome your questions and, of course, your guidance. Thank you. And in the interest of time for today, uh, we will make our way through the board presentation and allow ample time for the discussion. But we thank you very much for the time to focus on the Community Energy Plan. Um, we'll start off with a quick review of what the plan is, as well as the implementation successes for the last five years, and then roll right into the proposed uh, changes to the Community Energy Plan to bring us up to the current date. So the Community Energy Plan, if uh, folks recall, as uh, Chairman Dorsey had mentioned, it is a plan looking out between now and the year 2050 with milestones, 2020, 30, 40, uh, to generate, distribute, and store energy, and how we go about doing that in the most 
cost-effective manner. It was adopted by the County Board in June of 2013 as the, at that time, the newest comprehensive plan element. Uh, we split the energy issues into six different goal areas, and as we implement the Community Energy Plan, we simultaneously look at the variety of issues and designing the program initiatives by thinking about three different things. First of all, uh, Arlington County's economic competitiveness, its energy security, and its environmental commitment. So these are the six goal areas in the Community Energy Plan. District Energy there on the right-hand side, it was the, uh, one of the six goal areas in 2013. In yellow, we note that uh, in the proposed changes to the Community Energy Plan, we're proposing to change that to resilience. Uh, essentially, we're stepping back and, and looking at a more overarching uh, idea of how we address resilience throughout the entire community to include not only district energy and combined heat and power, but also other technologies such as uh, battery storage and solar combined to offer additional resilience to uh, homes and to businesses throughout the community. So with our land use planning and transportation planning dating back to the 60s with smart growth, uh, that was an innovative way to uh, mark out development and redevelopment for the Arlington community moving forward. Uh, when we did energy planning circa 2010 out to 2013, we recognized those successes and we wanted to emulate those successes by layering on energy planning uh, into those uh, various planning initiatives throughout Arlington County. And so that's the essence of what uh, we're endeavoring to do as we implement the Community Energy Plan. So speaking of implementation, these are just some of the success stories noted up on uh, the slide here. I want to kind of roll through them to give you an idea of the hard work of the, uh, the air team in spearheading the uh, CEP implementation. Joan Kelsch led an effort to uh, ensure that Arlington County became the first lead platinum community in the nation. And that was a significant achievement and got a lot of uh, uh, interest on the internet, if you remember back in uh, the 2018 era. Uh, Kathy Lynn, the uh, energy manager for Arlington Public Schools, has been doing a great job working with her team as well as working across with uh, the uh, AIR team with John Morrill and others. Uh, in implementing the Community Energy Plan with Arlington Public Schools. Discovery Elementary School, a shining star of that, um, when that uh, first opened, it was the largest net zero elementary school in the nation. And so, uh, great job uh, in uh, Arlington Public Schools and the work that they did then and they continue to do to this date. The Solar Co-op, very successful program. It has added numerous uh, solar photovoltaic systems on this uh, single family homes throughout Arlington County. In fact, there is another tranche of uh, potential solar co-op projects in the offing. This coming Thursday, there's an information session at Central Library starting at 6.30 p.m. So please go ahead and share that information far and wide for anyone interested in participating in that solar co-op program. And that uh, was in large part to Chris Summers who was on the uh, energy team and now being managed by Helen Reinecke Wilt. Um, as uh, we continue on with the next solar co-op session. Uh, Helen is also managing the Green Home Choice Program um, and successfully helping residents with their new additions as well as their home renovations, making those uh, energy efficient. Uh, Jessica Aberlin, been uh, instrumental in the Bonus Density Program as well as the Sustainable Buildings Policy Update. Uh, Charles Njoku has been working together with DTS, uh, uh, Department of Technology Services, as well as Management and Finance uh, to uh, essentially address energy management for county operations, as well as to streamline the energy billing process uh, throughout Arlington. And so that's been very successful. And last but not least, uh, Adam Siegel Moss has been doing a great job with the Energy Lending Library, working together with uh, Arlington Public Libraries to offer resources to citizens and residents on how to make intelligent uh, energy decisions. And all of those efforts, and then some, have led to a number of successes, and this infographic highlights just a few of those. I want to uh, showcase the uh, cost savings. Cumulatively, it is just south of $5 million per year throughout the community and the county are the cost savings due to the air programming and implementation of those programs. In addition to that, 24% uh, drop in greenhouse gas emissions during that same time frame has been the result of those hard efforts. 
This is a graphic showing the greenhouse gas emissions uh, over time from 2007 up to 2016. And it shows that the building sector, uh, as well as the transportation sector, uh, really take up the bulk of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the Arlington community. We started off our baseline at just under 13 metric tons per capita per year of CO2 emissions and CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, and that in the uh, 2016 greenhouse gas emissions inventory dropped all the way down to 9.1 metric tons. And so that all happened at the same time that there were a lot of what we'll call headwinds, a lot of things happening, recognizing that growth happens in Arlington. This is recognizing there uh, will be growth and it embraces that and it uh, builds it into its assumptions as we do our energy modeling. And so during that 2007 to 2016 timeframe, we had 18,000 new residents come into Arlington, over 10,000 new workers uh, joined the workforce in Arlington, and over 13,000 new housing units um, uh, came on board. And uh, even with that, we were able to drop our greenhouse gas or our energy use in buildings uh, by 11% and also uh, decrease the energy use in the transportation sector by 13%. In addition to Dominion doing its job in taking off some coal plants, bringing on uh, natural gas power plants, and helping to clean the grid to the tune of a 28% drop in the emissions rate. Another way to look at our emissions is through this pie chart. It essentially shows that, once again, buildings take up a good uh, chunk of the emissions at just under 60%. Transportation comes in at 36%. And it's important to note on this graphic that county government, while we can lead by example, we only make up 4% of the overall emissions for the entire community. This is also a breakdown of the uh, county government as well as Arlington Public Schools energy use dating from 2007 all the way to 2017, showing the progression of some changes. Um, some notable ideas uh, regarding this, county buildings, even though we increased uh, the square footage in county buildings by 17%, we were able to keep energy use relatively flat during that 10 year period. Arlington Public Schools also was able to uh, grow by 10% and its energy use only increased by 5%. And the art bus fleet in the yellow there you see, it increased six fold in its fleet size as well as passengers increased 300% due to new routes and service during that 10 year time frame. And again, it's important to note that we're able to drive down those greenhouse gas emissions during that entire time. So this is a timely uh, uh, CEP update. Uh, we, uh, in 2013, endeavored to be a leader in the energy sector and in community energy planning and continue to do that. And in doing so, we also recognize there are a lot of changes happening in the energy sector and the, uh, the marketplace, be it regionally, nationally, or internationally. Uh, new technologies come on board, it seems like daily. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the technologies mature over time and help the prices to drop, making them more accessible to a number of people. Some examples of that are uh, LED lights uh, during the last five years, as well as solar photovoltaic systems. Those prices have dropped dramatically during that time frame. We also recognize the changes happening at the state level with legislation as well as the updated Virginia Energy Plan. And then on the international level, you see there the IPCC reports um, paint a somewhat dire picture for the world if we don't act and act soon. And so uh, the proposed changes to the CEP reflect some of the community's desires and some of those changes that we believe is needed in order to affect change here in Arlington and elsewhere. In Arlington, uh, if we... Uh, adopt the proposed new changes to the community energy plan, that would result in an 88% drop in greenhouse gas emissions from the baseline of 2007 up to the year 2050. This is in comparison to some of these other locations. Uh, this is just a, a, a snapshot of some of other uh, localities throughout the country and recognizing some are uh, less ambitious than others uh, than us and then others are more ambitious than us, in, including Washington DC, uh, setting to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. So we've been at this uh, revisiting the community energy plan ever since that five year uh, marker back in 2018 and staff have been hard at work. John uh, Morrell has been leading an effort with a variety of consultants doing greenhouse gas emissions inventory work, energy modeling updates, as well as market research. Um, we've also done community engagement in a variety of different ways. The Energy Committee of the Environment and Energy Conservation Commission has been hard at work offering uh, a wonderful uh, set of comments and uh, ways to improve the community energy plan. In addition to that, as noted on the bottom line there, there have been 
um, a couple of uh, forums as well as community engagement opportunities. November 5th, there was a forum down the road at George Mason University, a follow-up forum on May 30th, uh, just recently, and then June 4th, we had an open house. Um, and all during those, we uh, took in comments, but in addition to that, we used it as an educational opportunity to once again let people know why we're doing what we're doing as well as what we're proposing to do on into the future. And during these forums, we had the opportunity to also use uh, instant polling and using um, people's cell phones and their smartphones. They were able to, in real time, vote on a variety of questions that we posed to the audiences in those forums. And so we were able to collect that information and all the information and the votes are up on the Community Energy Plan website. In addition to the outreach to external stakeholders, we also recognize the importance of working together with our colleagues across multiple departments. And so whether it's economic development, uh, community uh, planning, housing and development, and others, there you see the long list of other colleagues who have had the opportunity to weigh in and offer their comments on the draft community energy plan. In terms of feedback, there have been a lot of uh, comments that have come in, but we highlighted just some of the, the more common ones uh, in the next couple of slides. Once again, making the CEP bolder, brighter, and, and do things faster was an overarching comment across all our various sessions. During the voting uh, uh, on November 5th, uh, the people said that 63% of the people participating said incentives and financing were the most effective tool to increase the use of clean energy. In addition, we offered a willingness to pay question to the participants, and 62% of, uh, of those participants said that they would pay at least 5% more for energy in order to achieve those goals. And last but not least, people on a, a regular drumbeat throughout these sessions reminded us of those IPCC reports and how imperative it is for us to act and act now on our various implementation ideas. During the more recent um, uh, forums on May 30th and uh, June 4th, we had uh, very similar sorts of comments uh, in regards to the CEP goals, uh, as well as the incentive programs, and it highlighted the need to uh, be more, even more ambitious with uh, buildings, the transportation sector, and how we treat renewable energy. So this is a highlight of some of the, the big ticket items for the updates to the community energy plan. Uh, the 2050 goal in the 2013 Community Energy Plan was three metric tons. Uh, we're proposing to drop that down to one metric ton by the year 2050. In addition, a lot of comments during the last five years recognized the complexities of the uh, targets in the building section, and so we endeavored to go ahead and simplify that, still being true to our word as to increasing energy efficiency through site plans and other means for various buildings throughout the community, but simplifying those goals to make them more understandable. In the renewable energy section, we focused on 160 megawatts of on-site photovoltaics in Arlington. Uh, that was in the 2013. For the 2019 plan, we're also expanding beyond Arlington's borders to look at contractual agreements that would help to support even more solar photovoltaic systems to be installed outside of Arlington's borders and at the same time helping us to achieve our goals. We also mentioned the uh, resiliency chapter replaces district energy. And last but not least, uh, with EVs uh, driving around the streets of Arlington, and you see EV chargers uh, around the community as well. It is a trend towards electrification in the transportation sector, and we endeavor to go ahead and take advantage of those trends moving forward. So this is a graphic showing us uh, two different lines. The top line is the 2013 path toward our three metric ton goal, as shown in the 2013 Community Energy Plan. The bottom line uh, is two part. First of all, the green part shows the actual emissions drop uh, out to 2016. And it shows that we are uh, ahead of the game in terms of where we plan to be at this point in time. Um, it is uh, what we would call taking advantage of some of the low hanging fruit in order to get to where we are uh, with the uh, grid getting cleaner and also efficiency gains in the buildings and the transportation sector. Uh, and so the rest of that line, the orange line, drives us down to one metric ton by the year 2050. And it does that through a variety of different means. And this graphic shows uh, what we're talking about here. First of all, the top line, the dotted or dashed line, is what we'll call building or uh, business as usual. With the business as usual line, it recognizes there would be an increase in housing, population, and jobs, as well as a slight or nominal improvement in building codes during that time. So how are we gonna reach one metric ton by the year 2050? 
the, ret uh, the rest of this graphic shows that we'd be relying on the grid getting cleaner. Those are the two top wedges in blue. First of its uh, um, on the books reductions that are being planned for as well as proposed and uh, hopefully implemented on into the future um, gr changes to the grid. In addition to that, we would be adding more renewable energy generation on site as well as off site. Um, the buildings throughout Arlington County, be it homes as well as commercial buildings, would become more energy efficient over time. And then last but not least, that uh, bottom wedge shows the contribution of the transportation sector becoming cleaner uh, and also taking advantage of that cleaner grid as we uh, power hopefully a number of cars throughout Arlington through electric vehicles. So this graphic shows there are numerous strategies of increasing efficiency and taking advantage of cleaner fuels, and all of these are synergistic effects. And so um, that um, blurred graphic uh, gets to the point that we can do a, a, a pretty good job at taking a look at what's going to be happening on into the future. And then once we reach out to the year 2030 and onwards, um, we want to recognize that uh, no matter what changes happen in the energy marketplace, we are teed up through our recommendations and through our policies to be reactive and to be able to react accordingly to those marketplace changes. So for instance, we have certain assumptions built into our scenario as to how clean the grid will get if that grid does not get quite as clean, it'll put increased emphasis on buildings to become more energy efficient or the transportation sector to do its role in, a, in order for us to reach our one metric ton goal. Um, similarly, um, if renewable energy takes off, it places less pressure on the grid and less pressure on buildings to become more energy efficient and so forth. And so there's a mix of various uh, variables that are in play as we look out to the year 2050. So the question came up, how are we going to reach our goal of one metric ton? And so this is a relatively busy graphic uh, that, that uh, offers great detail as to our modeling assumptions. And once again, John Moore working together with our contractors and energy experts that, uh, that have done this for a while throughout the country. Um, has uh, put together this graphic that shows in, uh, primarily we're going to be relying on an increase in state energy efficiency programming and programs to help drive down the greenhouse gas emissions and increase efficiencies across buildings as well as the transportation sector. In the transportation sector, we embrace the master transportation plan and its embrace of uh, multimodal transportation. In addition to that, we also recognize that people do need to use cars, and in doing so, we will be advocating for electric vehicles being the future moving forward. Um, in addition to that, there's the increase of renewable energy, both on-site as well as using those off-site contractual agreements. And then we also want to note that three metric tons back in 2013 for that community energy plan, that was an ambitious goal. And we also recognize that one metric ton is going to be an ambitious goal if that is what is adopted. We also think it's transformative and realistic all at the same time. The question from the, a variety of actors in the community also came up as to saying, well, what would it take to get to zero metric tons per capita per year? Uh, in short, it would uh, be a heavier and greater lift in order to reach that, um, that goal. Uh, for instance, natural gas uh, in the, the building sector would have to be uh, done away with for uh, the most part and, and be quite challenging given the infrastructure that has been uh, put into play uh, to take advantage of the relatively expensive natural gas. In addition to that, to reach uh, that zero metric ton goal, it would maximize the use of renewable energy uh, using offsite and onsite means, as well as an increased and dramatically increased adoption of electric vehicles. Another question that's come up during conversations with a variety of stakeholders has been, well, can Arlington achieve 100% renewable electricity? And the short answer of this is, yes, uh, we can. And through a combination of measures, that is possible. Um, and so with this, we notice uh, that there's on-site renewable uh, uh, energy that could be put on in terms of county buildings as well as private sector buildings. Uh, we also recognize that off-site contra contractual agreements can contribute to that as well as the host of other uh, elements that are included on this slide. So one of the things that is not in the May 24th draft community energy plan that uh, is being proposed now as a, uh, one of two new proposed policies would include uh, renewable electricity for the government operations. And it is a two-parter, a two-phased uh, two approach where we would 
strive to become 50% renewable electricity for government operations by the year 2022, and then ramp up to achieve 100% renewable electricity for those same operations by the year 2025. And this gives an idea as to how we would go about doing that. It would be a mix of uh, the grid becoming cleaner. As of right now, there's renewable portfolio standards, uh, voluntary portfolio standards in Virginia. And with Dominion, they are at close to 8% now. And we envision by 2025, that would uh, ramp up to uh, 15%. In addition to that, we have the on-site solar in Arlington County's borders contributing to it. And then the vast majority of the uh, achievements would be in the result of those contractual agreements for off-site renewable energy to the tune of 50 megawatts of what are called power purchase agreements um, on into the off years. So that's for county government operations. For the community, uh, we have another proposal uh, for a new policy to be added to the renewable section, and that would be the community becoming 100% renewable electricity by the year 2035. And again, the devil's in the details. How would we get there? Uh, essentially, this pie chart shows uh, numerous ways in which that could happen. The grid continuing to uh, uh, get more renewable energy uh, put onto it so that uh, uh, close to a third of the grid would be renewable energy sources. The on-site renewable uh, would increase to 100 megawatts by the year 2035. The contractual off-site, the Dominion tariffs, and also something called renewable energy certificates are all uh, things that would complete that pie chart to help us reach that 100% renewable electricity by the year 2035. So it's important to note that um, we have economic competitiveness, energy security, and environmental commitment as, as the three lenses through which we make our decisions currently. We are advocating and, and introducing the idea of adding a fourth lens to that discussion and to that analysis, and that would be energy equity recognizing there are challenges in implementing the community energy plan across all socioeconomic levels. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone is brought along at the same time. And so adding energy equity as a fourth lens is one of the proposals or recommendations that we're endeavoring to weave into this update of the community energy plan. And even though we're not focusing on implementation with the Community Energy Plan Implementation Framework, it's just important to note that there are numerous ways to address energy equity moving forward. And this is just a sampling of some of those changes uh, to ensure that um, this is across the board uh, implemented at all of those uh, socioeconomic levels. In terms of regional collaboration, back in 2013, it was noted that uh, regional collaboration is quite important. And it's also important to note that the AIR team has been hard at work at uh, collaborating with numerous um, groups throughout the region and the state in order to help us reach our goals. And so whether this is the Virginia Energy Efficiency Council at the state level, uh, also Northern Virginia Regional Commission, uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. These are all groups that air staff have been uh, working together with closely in order to figure out how we achieve our goals, not only in Arlington, but also take the lessons learned and help um, everyone across the region benefit from this. And so we recognize in the building sector, uh, it's important. Uh, Jessica Aberland is spearheading an effort with a, a net zero uh, initiative with uh, the Council of Governments and others in order to advance net zero energy in buildings. And as we note here, the transportation sector, particularly pass-through traffic, it's important that we have that regional collaboration across those various groups in order for us to reach our goals. So in terms of next steps and, and logistics, uh, we have this session, and then uh, we are uh, preparing uh, the request to advertise county board report to come to the county board at its July meeting. Uh, in addition to that, we have numerous commission and community group meetings teed up for the coming months throughout the summer. Coming back to the board, uh, the request advertises for the board to uh, consider adoption of the CEP update. In addition to that, considering the green building incentive policy, uh, those are both uh, being planned for the September County Board meeting. And then once uh, the adoption uh, uh, were to happen, then we would have clear guidance as to how to mark up and modify the CEP implementation framework with, oh, by the way, the tools that would help us to reach our goals moving forward. And that would happen during the fourth quarter of this year.
Um, this conversation started with the county manager Schwartz um, raising the three key policy questions. Certainly your questions are not limited to these areas, but in terms of our key guidance, we would like to be able to, to take away um, your wisdom by the end of the session on these three key, key questions. Yeah, feedback, that sounds much better, much better. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well done presentation covering all the key issues. As we know, we do have uh, our Energy and Environment Conserv uh, Conservation Commission, E2C2, which has an energy committee that we stood up, I think now about two and a half years ago, maybe something along those lines. And they provided us with a, a host of questions and comments, which uh, I know every board member has had a chance uh, to receive and review. This discussion is with us at this point so that we can wrap our head around these key issues and deliver staff some feedback on these key uh, questions and themes. But why don't we just start if, if there are any questions. And I see Ms. Crystal with her light on. Great. I actually have a number of questions. Let me start with one that I think will help me at least uh, get my head around how we get to zero, which I, I think all of us are interested in doing and, and want to make sure we're understanding. Uh, exactly how aggressive of an approach as Mr. Julie characterized that would require. Um, one of the questions I have is understanding us in context of other communities that have adopted more aggressive zero emissions goals. So uh, for framing purposes, when I look at, for example, the slide, I think it was slide 20, um, it's the one with the figure of the proposed path to, to 2050 that sort of shows the um, tranches by sector. Yes. So when you see communities that have made a, commission, a commitment to get to zero emissions, um, is it generally, because generally, you know, these sort of sectors or options are pretty similar across communities. Do, do other communities tend to get to zero by um, assuming, uh, you know, reductions kind of equally across or new technological advantages across, or are they more aggressively leaning into or making assumptions on one? You know, are they, for example, saying, we're going to make a much greater investment in off-site generation? Or are there just assumptions to, to sort of reduce all equally? Does that make sense? I'm trying to get a sense of, of where this differs from a community that's taken a more aggressive tack. I'll let Demetra provide more detail, but let me just make an uh, observation. We've had um, a number of conversations with some of these other communities. Demetra's had conversations. And um, it's a balancing act. We'll take whatever guidance the board uh, obviously wants to choose for our goals. But it, it's the implementation is what really matters. <laughs> And the details of that information, I think that's what your question is oriented around. What, what are the details that get you there? And um, unfortunately, when we called some of these people and asked them, what, what are your detailed plans to get there? They said, uh, we have no idea. We, we, ha we have simply no idea. It was you know, kind of a political goal that was set, and we're trying to figure it out. So, Demetra, I'll let you uh, answer. It's a helpful and honest answer. <laughs> yeah. That's a polite way of saying that maybe we wouldn't see this chart in any of these other plans yeah, to the and, degree in which. Okay. You know, and, and the goal, the goals that we set and the implementation is kind of a chicken egg thing, obviously. Um, but, you know, we certainly, as you said at the beginning of uh, Chair Dorsey, want to have realistic goals and um, be aspirationally at realistic. And I can have That's, Okay, we're going to let Ms. McBride comment. Federal buildings, go there. <laughs> uh, well, uh, if we could just actually have an answer to that question, that'd be great. And then yeah. we can move on. Um, very quickly, um, because Greg did say there are levels of granularity um, and sometimes less granularity in other plans. Um, and there are possible strategies that people, so you'll see menus of strategies for implementation. The other thing that is key, um, and it's important to note, and it's not by way of excuse, it's just an explanation, is that there are other um, jurisdictions, for example, Washington, D.C. Fantastic sustainability plan. It's 2.0, it's just a thing of beauty. It's exquisite on every level. It's also backed by a publicly owned utility and the publicly owned utility since 2014 has had $20 million in funding um, on an annual basis. And it's also had autonomy within that structure to be able to say, okay, we're gonna put this into charging infrastructure, this into energy equity, this into on or off-site renewables. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple of different levers. And then last but not least, there's also policy at the state level. 
And while the state took, Virginia took, you know, great strides last year with SB 966 and with the update of the Energy, um, uh, State Energy Act, they themselves have a combination of hard targets, but also aspirational targets that are very large and very meaningful, but not clearly laid out or mapped. So if I, oh, please. I just want to layer on to the, the uh, previous comments to also note that depends on where they start. And so each jurisdiction is going to have a different mix. If you recall the buildings versus transportation and so forth, so where their baseline is will help uh, drive what their implementation efforts are and, and what they need to do in order to drive down the emissions respectively in those different sectors. Um, secondly, it's important to note in Arlington, energy efficiency first across all sectors. And then we layer on to that the, the goal of clean energy and, and renewable energy additions. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, it's important to know in, in places like New York State, um, they have a brand new climate plan that is yet to be signed off by the governor. Uh, but the, with that, um, they're not striving necessarily to reach all the way to zero through actual emission reductions. But in addition to reaching up to 85%, emissions reductions, they're layering the onto that other elements such as carbon offsets. And so each one, it's, uh, each jurisdiction's a snowflake. So if I, I'll just check for understanding and then yield the floor. There's not, uh, there's not one lever that others are pulling harder than we are. Uh, it's more of a kind of contextual full picture or in some cases a, a picture that's more of an uh, objective without details. Okay. That would be accurate. And it's customized for every jurisdiction, every state as well. Okay, along this line, Ms. Garvey. Yeah, and I was just going to, when I was briefed before, it was my understanding that the district, as wonderful and beautiful as it is, it actually doesn't include federal buildings. Is that correct? This is true, and neither do we, in yeah. all fairness yeah. and disclosure. So DC's goals, obviously, you know, it's not that they're slacking or looking the other way. They have no control over the federal buildings or the federal fleet. And I would guess that their proportion their proportionate share of their building stock and their fleet um, that's comprised of federal elements is probably larger than ours. And um, and I just to pursue a little bit where we were before, um, you know, I had this trip to Germany, which has just been still rattling around my head because I learned so much um, and still trying to get my head around all of it. One of the things that was interesting there, I think, is that um, a, a number of years ago, they went to like two, two or four major utilities for the entire country down to 1,200. And so every individual jurisdiction, it was interesting what you said about the district. So in Germany, the mayor determines the, the policy. So they can say, we're not using coal anymore. And the, the utility has to do it. Um, and in fact, any, any profits generated by the utility go to the jurisdiction so that all your citizens are kind of owners of the utility. It's sort of an interesting, um, I, I assume we couldn't get there anywhere very easily given our laws. However, um, are we able to, to, to Mm, ramp it up more on um, our own solar individual productions, which we, I guess, called district energy before, but resiliency, I like that term. Um, the mayor of Boltrup said that he's starting to look at every, every neighborhood as an energy producer and that each neighborhood is producing its own energy and they're, they're using a lot of solar and some wind. And I noticed in our plan that it's fairly small what we think we're individually going to be producing here. Is there a way for us to ramp that up more it, just by putting more solar on roofs? I mean, it looks to me like that's what they were doing in some of these localities in Germany. Is that a fair question? I'm going to ask John to give you an in-depth. I, I do want to say that when you talk about Germany, you do have a model for that in the United States. You have either publicly owned utilities or you have community choice aggregation, which is running through, I think, seven states now. Um, you probably can, and again, John, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to him, but looking more in the future, part of that is going to be the advancements in the technology as well, which are being ramped up. Right, I mean, if anybody wanted pace to now. propose our own utility, I'd be real interested. <laughs> well, there, there is certainly substantial uh, potential for solar electric generation here in Arlington. Uh, the community plan, community energy plan, has a goal of 160 megawatts of solar by 2050. And in one of the pie charts, I assume that, or I showed that, well, let's say we get 100 megawatts of uh, solar by 2035. That is, that is a lot of solar. That is a four kilowatt system on 25,000 houses. So it's a, um, uh, 
it's substantial. Uh, and of course, then there's also on top of commercial buildings. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, we, we love our trees. We have, a, we have a, a strong urban forestry plan and uh, we have an expression that trees trump solar. Um, of course, on commercial buildings, they're up above the uh, tree canopy and so that roof area is available. But again, rooftops are also a valuable amenity for the commercial uh, properties. You often have pools or gardens or um, amenity spaces. So, and, and of course, then as, as solar continues developing, uh, we anticipate that there'll be essentially glass windows that are also solar uh, electricity generators so that you can have vertical exposures on some of the uh, taller buildings. But there's nothing small about 100 megawatts of um, uh, solar installation in our small area. And I'd also, well, and, and so that, that is a contributor to electricity. And then there's all the other the fuel, the other fuels, the gas and, and so forth, that is an additional energy use in Arlington. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. We'll move to uh, Mr. Gushall, but I, I, I will just say as an editorial comment, you know, the, the slide on, on uh, the figure on slide 13, you know, talks about our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And it's, it's safe to say we'd love to target zero. It's not an issue. It's, it's just that as we construct this plan, it's, uh, we've, we've displayed how we think we can get to one. Um, that is what we think is the working framework, even though we don't have any objection to having a vision for zero. We just don't quite know how you would articulate that to us in a reasonable way today. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, as John has always pointed out, it's not the only reason, but for example, we would have to make assumptions about the marketplace as well. So you would have to assume, for example, that there is no longer any Washington gas and that no one is using gas because there are emissions associated with that. Um, so it's not to say that there might be a technology or some other kind of mechanism for offsetting that, um, including offsets, but uh, to get to zero, that, that second very busy slide would, would, a lot of those levers would have to be pulled. Indeed, right. Mr. Gutschall. So uh, thank you for that because that's actually exactly what I wanted to point, uh, to, to drill into just a little bit, the, the notion of, of offsets and getting to zero, meaning total zero emissions by year 2050 versus net zero or carbon neutral, right? Where you might still have Washington gas customers, but you, you're net zero at, by year 2050 because you have those offsets or because you're, um, you're paying for, I guess that would be offsets if you're paying for carbon extraction or uh, direct extraction from the atmosphere, assuming that technology progresses, et cetera. And I think where, so where I'm going with my question is, is could you clarify zero metric tons per capita versus an overall carbon neutral net zero? What does that look like? And since we had on the screen uh, real quick, because I think this is important to note, uh, on slide 13, there was, um, we recently received, it was in manager's notes last month, that we received from the Carbon Disclosure Project that we're one of 43A cities globally, right? Which I think we rightly should take, to, should take pride in that. Two of the cities that are on slide 13 that are show uh, San Francisco and New York City that are showing less than us now on the CDP website are showing as having carbon neutral by 2050 targets. And I think what this is all is my point that, I'm that I want to make here, that I want to hear your reaction to, is that it seems to me that things are evolving quite rapidly. So I'm, I'm not at all, first of all, suggesting that this slide 13 was in, is intentionally out of date. I think that's just how fast things are evolving, correct? But since things are so evolving so rapidly, I'm, I'm wondering if you could help me to understand, because to, to Mr. Dorsey's point, that you're not prepared to present to us the exact scenarios, but I do hear from you that we are, the scenarios that we are presenting are really based on what we know today with limited assumptions about further improvements. And one of your responses um, uh, 
to the questions that I had submitted earlier, you, you, you acknowledge that um, we're experiencing rapid consensus on climate change that is transcending political, social, marketing, and other factors. And under these circumstances, we expect an acceleration of technology, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not clear from this response is how is that included in the one metric ton and how is that included uh, in a net zero target? That's a lot, I'm sorry yeah. about that. I think there are a couple of answers. I'll kick off the answer um, by just saying that um, I think at its foundation is basically an element of control. When you look at um, San Francisco, and we do have to correct that because we just noted the, the, new, the most recent goal last night, um, they're going to be carbon neutral, but San Francisco is a community choice aggregation organization. So they've taken control, much as these jurisdictions, they disaggregated in Germany. So there's that, and then other um, cities such as New York, again, as Rich said, took very decisive and laid hard targets um, at the state level in New York. And through NYSERDA, there's an enormous amount, not just in terms of policy and setting goals, but the states and, and these CCAs, these aggregators or these quasi-public utilities have also allocated significant, in New York's case, significant amounts of funding um, at the state level. Um, so I think that's a foundation for a gap that we can't be certain today that we would have. And I'll leave it over. John, I'll punt to you for really technical. Sure. Um, so the, the assumptions that went into the model to get us to one ton per capita, um, there's nothing easy about these. Um, this, uh, we're still assuming that, that, for example, the state of Virginia joins the regional greenhouse gas initiative, uh, very robust investments in solar, um, continuous, robust, and successful energy efficiency programs with emerging technologies on an annual basis to keep driving um, uh, energy efficiency forward. And, and then also the electric vehicle um, uh, penetration of the market, extremely strong, which will really only happen if the technological improvements continue and the costs come down to enable the market to, to, to take hold. I'd note that we were working on, um, we focused on actual greenhouse gas reductions um, to count to Arlington in Arlington, in part because the community energy plan um, addresses a number of the other benefits that come from energy efficiency and cleaner uh, electricity and, and the co-benefits from driving greenhouse gas emissions down, whether it's money savings, economic development, energy security, energy resilience. So we were focused on the, the, the getting Arlington's numbers down. On the question of, of offsets and net carbon zero, um, that is certainly an option for that last, uh, I want to call it the last mile. I mean, that, that is a way to overcome that last bit, because that last bit is going to be the hardest part to literally zero out. But if, if carbon offsets, if, if a robust, um, serious market emerges with you know, certifiable projects and, and that kind of then trading emerges, then that is a, a new consideration. Thank, thank you. And if, if I may, real quick, the follow-up. Uh, do we know what, I guess we would know, uh, we could approximate what the current price of, a, of an offset for a, a metric ton of CO2 would be? And I know it'd be hard to project that out into 2050. But, yeah, but well, in, in, uh, it, it's anywhere from $8 to $30 per ton, depending upon the market, depending upon the actors. There's no single market price now. It's a fairly chaotic market. Uh, but it's worth noting that a number of major corporations and, and energy producers and users are including uh, carbon pricing in their long-term projections for what's going to happen to their industry. So uh, 
it, it is, it is l perhaps going to emerge. Um, it's, that's one of the unknowns. So the model includes our population growth, projected growth. And if, if it's possible that you could then do some kind of look at what future carbon pricing might be, and so if we had to have offsets, if you could, in, if you could include that in a future version of the model, I would find that very useful to understand what, because that might be the bottom wedge that ends up that would get us to zero if we're, if we're going to rely on offsets. So that would right. be helpful to me. <clears throat> would we you would have be... any guidance on how they should price it? What what they should look at from I would want to I would want to hear from them what their research says of what I'm, from uh, from my own uh, googling pr the pricing right now is all over the place right California's yeah. at 15 Sweden's at 99 so I think you know I would want your professional opinion of what is a, what, I, what are some reasonable assumptions recognizing that there could be huge ranges in there I, I don't know if I have that yeah. crystal ball yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I would note that up there on um, Actually, the next slide, Rich. Essentially, this is where in the second um, category, renewable energy, we have some energy users offset more than 100% of their own use. That is essentially the concept we're talking about of, of some actors. It doesn't have to be government, certainly, but actors who decide to um, go beyond 100% for themselves in carbon reduction. All right. Mr. DeFerranti has been waiting for a while. Sure. So um, Mr. Gutschel had a number of questions packed in there, and I just want to make sure I, I heard right. Our current plan is predicated on zero carbon emissions. Is that right? Working towards, we're at one metric ton, you would work towards zero carbon emissions per person? Our the current, current plan is at three. We're moving towards one, and there's the question of whether we should move to zero. zero. Yeah, and I just want to see if I understand the measure of zero of what? And I think it's zero of carbon emissions. And I would like sort of echoing a little bit, Mr. Gutschals, but I, I fundamentally think that our measure should, we, sh we should be measuring on carbon neutral um, because I think that's a better measure. To do what we want to do with the population growth that is going to be in Arlington and other close in other cities, we're going to have to go big on off-site solar, and, and I know that's part of your modeling, but I think as a, it's just helpful to hear, I think we're gonna have to go really big on that. Instead of going to rural areas for coal, which we did 20 years ago, we will go to rural areas for solar and for wind. And so I just wanna make sure I understand, currently we're on zero carbon emissions. I'd love to change that metric to carbon neutral. Is, is it right that we're currently, the way you've structured it, on carbon emissions? Uh, at the moment? Well, I, I, I think they're two sides of the same coin. One is zero carbon emissions, which is a great leap forward from one. Yep. The other is net carbon, net zero carbon, mm -hmm. where literal in jurisdiction doesn't go down to zero, but that is compensated by other measures. That's right. Okay. That's, that's what I'm really changing that way we measure is, is, uh, would be very much of interest as we go forward to what we bring on the request to advertise. Because I think to be concrete about it, there's not just the equity points that you've raised. There's not just um, ways in which we should look towards offsite, but we need to unleash those with means to invest in energy efficiency. If you go anywhere in Arlington where they are somewhat lucky with a, a, a single family home, most of them will say, I would pay a lot more, I would invest, I would pay differential levels of, of energy bills so that we can get to carbon zero. And so that's kind of behind the question. All right, uh, we'll move to Ms. Crystal and then Ms. Garvey, Mr. Gushaw, and just work our way down the line. Great, thank you. Um, Speaking of one of our biggest sectors, uh, commercial buildings, I wanted to ask staff if you could say a little more, and I recognize this is a, a handoff between DES and CPHD, 
But I appreciated your mentioning that the green building incentive policy would likely be coming back to us at our September meeting. But while we're here, we've got some good minds in the audience as well as this team at the table. Could you give us a little bit of a preview about how you all, at least from the community energy plan lens, are thinking that might change? Uh, one of, for example, one of the things I know we've talked a lot about is lead silver versus lead gold. Increasingly now, also thinking for resi commercial residential buildings, earthcraft. So any, any insights you can shed about what might be coming to us later in that area? Um, thank you for asking. Um, we are uh, coming to you with a, um, an addition to the Green Building Incentive Program to offer developers the opportunity to go for zero carbon. Um, at the moment, we have a, um, the program is a LEED Plus program, so we offer density for LEED, silver, gold, or platinum in addition to minimum energy requirements, so it's not just the LEED requirements, we actually ask for more than that. Um, we ask for energy reporting for 10 years, which gives us a sense of what the building is actually using. And then uh, for office buildings in particular, we're asking for Energy Star certification, which is a post-occupancy um, certification that a building meets a certain energy standard, a actual use, not just design and construction. Um, that's been a, a very successful program to date. The last time we updated the program in 2014, we added this net zero energy option, which is very, very difficult to achieve on tall buildings. So big, tall buildings only have this much roof area to generate solar. You Really, really hard to do that, if not impossible. Zero carbon allows you to generate that electricity off-site. Mm -hmm. So you would still, you would build a very energy efficient building, a very low energy use intensity building, um, and be able to offset that energy with an off-site um, generation source presumably solar, um, and that would be, that that's actually doable um, to do the math and, and have that done. Um, this is a voluntary option. It's not something we're requiring. We're giving developers a choice, um, and we're hoping that that might in inspire somebody to think about building a building somewhat differently and offsetting their energy use, get, which is a huge step towards getting to zero. Great. And Ms. Kelsch, I really appreciated that you noted that our current standards for bonus density are not just LEED. It's LEED plus energy reporting yes. plus um, the Energy Star post-occupancy. Um, nevertheless, one of the things I know we've talked about often from the board or in the community, and I think with you all, is whether um, LEED Silver ought mm -hmm. to be incented anymore, mm -hmm. um, whether we're essentially incenting uh, commercial developers to do something they'd probably do mm -hmm. anyway because it's in their interest with the building. Um, uh, is there any insight you can provide to that question? I know it's also a conversation to be had with mm -hmm. CPHD and perhaps the county attorney, yeah. but anything you'd say about uh, the, the, it sounds like the change so far would be an additional path. Is there any discussion or recommendation about maybe closing off one path for bonus density? We are, um, the last update was in 2014, which is five years ago now, and we will, as soon as this is all done, one of the first implementation things we'd like to bring to you is the zero carbon, hopefully in September, and then as soon as that's over, we will look at an update to the green building program. That is a big community engagement process. That doesn't happen overnight, okay. um, but that is definitely on our plate. It is time to do that, and we will look at different lead levels. We will uh, look at earthcraft. We'll look at what kind of energy requirements we should have, all sorts of different things, how much density we offer for different levels. All of that's on the table. We welcome all sorts of input from you all, from developers, environmentalists, whoever want input on that, but it's time to relook at that for sure. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify, lead silver is not um, necessarily easy, and particularly since we're asking for lead silver plus this extra energy component, they have to meet the prerequisites, but we're really asking them to do more than that. Um, it's not just lead silver. It, what, originally, that's what it was, but it's really not anymore. It's, it's extra. And Ms. Kelsch, it's true that lead and their various categories are not static. They evolve with changing technology and trends. What's the, what's the interval and frequency at which the, <laughs> the certifying organization might go ahead and, and up the ante within the silver, gold, platinum levels? Yeah, so they lead, like us, in, in, um, improves their program as the building code in, it, um, ramps up, as technology changes, all that kind of thing. I think they're, they're sort of on a two or three year schedule. They'll update it and then they'll find some glitches and they'll do some addendums. So it's just kind of this constant upgrade. Um, lead version four is the version that we prefer at the moment. Um, it's the, if you're a new building going for certification, you have to uh, file under lead version four. The baseline energy use in, in version four is, is much higher, which is why we like it. And then we ask for a little bit extra on top of that. So it's, it, we're moving in the right direction. We will update the program. LEED will continue to update. It's all headed where we need it to go. Yeah, say that not to say that I'm not interested in maybe upping the ante, but it certainly doesn't mean that 
a lead silver. Lead silver has evolved over time to actually move more in the community's favor than when, when this began. Absolutely, but I, it's, uh, I imagine the commercial real estate market has also evolved too, where you mm -hmm. have tenants, for example, interested yep. in that standard. And I think the, the question does remain of whether we are incentivizing something that might be done anyway. Um, it's a little bit of a, a risk, yep. right, to entertain. We certainly don't want um, anyone to back away from the potential to achieve bonus density by creating more environmentally sustainable buildings in service of our CEP goals. Mm -hmm. um, as we talk about the, the RTA or the discussion in September, I would appreciate, uh, I, I have to admit, I um, did not know there was a difference between our green building incentive policy and the green building program you were just describing, which might take mm. a greater look. So I think it would help me to understand a little bit more. Um, I want to make sure we do things comprehensively, right. um, but I also want to make sure we're not losing opportunities in the mm -hmm. immediate because we are seeing a lot of redevelopment mm -hmm. in quite a few sectors. So helping me understand the sort of um, push-pull of comprehensiveness and then uh, swift mm -hmm. action uh, and the distinction between those two policies, what we can amend now and what would need more mm -hmm. engagement would be helpful. It doesn't have to be now, but... Yeah. It I think, I think that when I talk about the green building policy and the green building program, it's the same thing. Okay. This is just a little tiny tweak that can be done with the addition of three words to the policy and <laughs> zero carbon. It's I very see. simple and easy. If we can explain it to you all and it's understandable and approvable, then that happens quickly. So it's not a different document. It's, it's just this, the scope of the changes it's being just, small relative to large. Just time. offering one more new option to developers that's come on board. We don't want to wait a year and a half to, to offer it. It's something that okay. folks that are in the queue could take advantage of now and let's not wait. Okay. Let's just get it done and do that soon. All right. So much more discussion to come in September. Absolutely. But this has been really helpful. Thank Good. you. Thank you. I think I recognize Ms. Garvey and My then turn Mr. Next. Yep. Um, so I'm glad to hear that we're going to take a total relook. Wait, wait, Ms. Kulsh, wait a minute because the next question might be briefly for you and then I think Mr. Morrill. Um, but I am glad we're taking a, a whole look because I've gotten increasingly uncomfortable that we sort of seem to focus on lead and I'm not sure that that's the best way to go. So um, I think the real theme here is how much things keep changing and that we have to keep. So if we can make it a whole lot better with tweaking three words, that's great. Um, why? I know this sounds like a stupid question. Why don't we see more solar panels on walls? Sometimes walls are south facing and they get a lot of sun. I think it's a cost issue at this point. The technology's not quite there yet. Um, John was mentioning embedded um, solar windows. In windows. Yeah. Um, do, it's doable, it exists, but it just costs a lot of money. Um, hanging vertical solar panels on a building can provide shading and some other benefits as right. well, but it's just, it's just more expensive. Okay, so we, we, we maybe will get there, because I think that would be... I think that technology is coming, for yeah. sure. Um, just not quite ready for the market, okay. for the market right. yet. Very interesting. Maybe we have a large company building that might be interested in kind of tweaking that We're and pulling it forward. For that options. would be great, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then... Uh, could you, you know, back on the sort of the theme of producing our own energy, um, you know, we have the solar co-op program, which one yep. of my daughters is using. Great. I know Northern Virginia Regional Commission does Solarize, which does mm -hmm. something similar. Could you explain a little bit the differences between the two programs? And I sometimes wonder if maybe we ought to be promoting Solarize as well so that people can kind of, it's nice to have a menu for people to choose from. And I figure that that's maybe whoever wants to answer the question yeah. is fine. I think the programs are very similar in that they um, offer reduced rates through group purchasing. Um, we've promoted the solar co-op program in Arlington. It's also available to others in other jurisdictions. Um, it's just a, it's a simplicity and marketing issue. We don't want to have people confused about which program to use. Um, but it seems to, one of the, with a co-op, you have to, you know, it, it's all, everybody goes together. So there's sort of a schedule thing. I think with Solarize, is that more individual where they come out and sort of look at your own house and you don't have to wait for another group of people. Is that True. Um, That's my understanding. I'm not exactly sure how Solarize works because we don't use it in Arlington, but, hmm. but the solar co-op, you get an individual assessment of your house um, kind of within a three or four month period, and then they want to purchase the stuff all at once, which is where you get the cost savings. Right. And then there's a, a schedule over the next three or four months for installation. Right. So Okay. You know, I would like, it, not now, but maybe a little bit of a look, as I say. I, I know we don't want to confuse people, but sometimes something doesn't work for somebody, but if they did, mm -hmm. the other thing is available yeah. that might work for them, and I think the right. more um, kind of diversity in that programs we have, it might be better. Yeah. So I'd love to have just a little more follow-up on that. I think Solarize is available to Arlingtonians. If yeah, but we don't, do it, we don't, they probably need to know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be, okay. be nice they if they kind of evolved in, in parallel, so. It, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. Sure. All right, Mr. Gutschall. My turn's up. Thank you. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about the, the short-term goals and 
thank you, uh, and, and specific with the, with the county facilities, and, and thank you very much for the work that you've done to bring us forth uh, options now for both within the county, uh, it's, if I have it correctly, it's 100% uh, renewable electricity by 2025, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And that's an option, so I guess you're looking for feedback from us, so for me, yes, 100% yes. And then uh, also that I think you've done the work too, and I believe that staff is supportive of 100% um, community-wide electricity uh, by 2035, recognizing totally that this is gonna require a lot of um, help from the state and, uh, and regional and otherwise, that there's, that there's a lot of other things that have to fall into place for that to happen, but we're gonna do our part and we're gonna make sure that it's part of our legislative uh, agenda to, to make that happen. So again, I'm, I'm very supportive of that and very thankful to staff for bringing that forward. Now I wanted to talk specifically uh, and, and follow up to the question that I had submitted in writing about um, our facility sustainability policy for county facilities. And um, what I'm a little bit uh, unclear about is, is I know that uh, we measure the uh, energy intensity, energy use intensity um, of these and that we have, we now have a policy that is, well, see, it's not really a policy, it's in an administrative regulation uh, which is entirely managed by the staff, that's the managers, uh, has full control over that. And that's where I think I'm turned around a little bit, is why would we have very specific targets and metrics uh, in an AR and not have some kind of, of targets um, specifically for our own county facilities as part of, of the CEP? In other words, there's, there's no mention in the CEP for county facilities for EUI targets, is there? Yeah. Well, I, I think that level of detail is something we would get into in the implementation plan um, when the uh, original community energy plan was issued. We uh, followed that up with a county operations internal energy plan, which included uh, targets for we have EUI targets for, for buildings. And so uh, we'll be taking a cue from, uh, from the, already this internal policy, which is, it, there's, it's not slacker. The, the internal um, uh, facility sustainability policy sets, sets um, tough goals for new construction and renovation for the foreseeable future. And so, um, it's, I, we feel it's in there. It's not slacker, that's for sure, and I want to be clear that I agree with you on that. What I, what I am looking for clarity on for, as when we come forward with the RTA, is, is how would we know that, what, what are we measuring that? It's not slacker, but what are we measuring the, the, that policy, its progress towards what? Right now, if assuming we're all in agreement here and we do move forward with the goal of getting to 100% uh, uh, renewable electricity by, for the county facilities by 2025, obviously you're going to want to have very efficient buildings in order to make that happen. But that's you know that this is this is an important piece, the EUI and all that to to that much larger goal. And I'm questioning: shouldn't we have some some better specific metrics as part of our policy, our goals, that the community and everybody can see that we are measuring how your not slacker administrative regulations are, me are, are meeting towards that. So do, do you understand what I'm asking for? Um, I, I, I think so. We, um, we, do em we haven't embraced um, specific, in, in this rewrite, we haven't put in specific targets for county operations buildings. Um, but in addition to the sustainable building policy, we have, we have joined the Department of Energy's Better Buildings Challenge, where we accepted the goal of reducing energy use per square foot in our entire portfolio by 20% by 2022. And so every year we have to report to the Department of Energy on our entire portfolio, the stars, the lemons, everything. And that keeps us engaged and focused on on the energy performance. So is there At reluctance the to bring that into the CEP? 
Is there a what? A, a reluctance to bring that kind of goal into the CEP? No, I, I think it might be made as passing reference, but but I mean this is this is a sort of a 2022 goal, and it, and it's very much implementation. You know, it's 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 at the implementation level, I think. Whereas we see this the community energy plan as being a, a, a 20,000 foot policy guidance document. Well, I'll yield the floor, but I think it's it's at the implementation level, but implementing what? is where I'm stuck a little bit. Okay. Mr. DeFranti. So um, I just want to, slide 25, um, I want a big thanks for the goals. Um, this is um, huge for me because I think long-term goals without benchmarks to get there is, is not super helpful. And just so that we're being, I'm being kind of careful and You've been, I appreciate your caution about over-promising. Um, I'd love to see, and maybe we don't know it offhand right now, I'd love to see where we are now on renewable energy, re renewable electricity for government operations. Um, and that's, you know, before we get to the RTA, that's what I'd love to know. Um, just because I don't, you know, I want to go to 100% by 2025. That's really important to me. But I also don't want to over-promise if we actually can't get there, I'd love to know that too, because I don't want to just be about, you know, as I see it, what Germany has done, they're at net carbon neutral by 2050, and they are changing their entire country to get there. And that's very different from what New York State just did last night, which is like, we're going to promise the sky. And, you know, that's not what I want to do. I want to drive change through our, our work. So, do you know what our percentage of renewable electricity is at the moment, and or could you get that in July or September? Uh, yes, I, I could pin it down um, by July. Uh, offhand, it's it's a fraction, a small fraction of one percent. Wow. Okay, so 2020, 2022 is a big goal. It is, but it it's largely um, we have to. Well, actually, it's on site. It's well under one percent. Right. Uh, we'd have to, I guess, give credit for the Dominion yep. seven percent or so, seven or eight percent. And given the limited uh, roof area of county facilities and the very energy intensive activities we do, for example, the water utility and wastewater treatment is a very energy intensive thing. Uh, we we you know, solar on site will will never cover that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why pursuing the off-site contract for new renewable power is critical to meeting this goal. Sure. So then the only other thing is I just want to flag to follow up. I talked a little bit about you, this with you, Mr. Chair, so weatherization assistance program and, and how we can help low-income uh, buildings that, that, are, that are not owned by those who have a lot of wealth to invest in a large single-family home. You know, I worked with Habitat for Humanity on the weatherization assistance program. There is single family and multifamily weatherization. And I know that we have a program. I just don't always feel that the community action agencies that run this program nationally aren't infused throughout. And maybe this, I just want to make sure we catalyze that. That's something that in July or September, I'd really love to at least be a little bit of a focus point, maybe of a briefing or, or at least of our RTA if we can. All right, back down the line, Ms. Garvey. All right, back again. Following a little bit on what um, Mr. Gutschall was talking about, I mean, Eric, I was hearing you a little bit, this is the big policy level, and what I'm hearing, and I could be wrong, so that what you're looking for, which is a little bit actually what we have here, but an annual sort of a dashboard on how we're doing. So some ways, some metrics. So you've got the big policy, and then you've got some metrics on how you measure it. And we don't wait, you know, till the five-year update. We look at it every year just to kind of see how we're doing. So that may have been a little bit where you were. That's what I was hearing and what you were saying. And it's something that I'm kind of interested in too. And, and I know that's, you know, we just, just sort of inspire. So like you have that one, uh, what's, what slide is this? I don't know. We've got, uh, we've got a number of nice graphs. This is the one on the emissions profile with the red and the blue and the green mix shows real clearly that we're going down from 20, uh, 2007 to 2016. But maybe we don't do it every, um, you know, four years or something, maybe every year. Um, and then along those I sent in, um, and, it, and it raised specters of Jimmy Carter for one of my colleagues. Um, could we uh, talk to me a little bit about how we um, 
climatize our buildings. So in this room, for example, and I think it's just an old system because we go from being like all of a sudden it's starting to get hot, people are kind of loosening their shirts and thinking, taking my jacket off and then we adjust something over there and then pretty soon I'm going back to getting, thinking about getting a shawl to wrap around and wishing that I had closed toes. We seem to just go back in these swings and yet I think some systems keep it more even, which I assume is a better thing to do. Uh, thank you for that really pragmatic question that a lot of us can relate to. Um, we generally, just in the facilities management realm, we generally try to keep it around 72 degrees, since that's kind of the sweet spot for the wide variety of temperature tastes that are And is there. that summer and winter? It's always 72? Generally, yeah, it's around, you know, right in that realm. Hmm. So temperatures within any particular heated or cooled space can vary quite a bit. Uh, depending on where you are in the room, proximity to the window. If you're on, the, if you're on a north window in the, in the middle of a really cold, windy day, and, you're, yeah, and that window is just, you're going to feel cold no matter what, unless there's a lot of air circulation, and most of our systems don't circulate that much. And similarly, like on a day like today, if you're right on a southern window and parked up right next to it, you're going you're gonna to get that radiant heat off that window, even if it's a great window. So. Managing within a space is difficult to get a consistent temperature across that space, even with fairly modern systems. We do a lot with our building automation systems to try to save energy, um, you know, with, with you know, the night shutoffs and the ramp up in the morning just in time and so forth. Um, the energy saved is really important, but the cost of humans is really expensive too, and keeping them productive is is kind of where the big money is um, that we have to keep in balance. Right. And, no, and, and I, I totally agree. And, I, you know, I, obviously there's a re this seems like low-hanging fruit, and if we haven't picked it, that it really must not be. Um, but I think, and I'm guessing a lot of it is poor systems that just really don't handle, diff one room is really hot, the other room's really cold, and try it's just really hard to do. Um, but I'd like to posit, so maybe... 72 is what we keep it maybe in the summer. We think about 74. But if you keep having this up and down, um, and I, I heard about when I was overseas, they were talking about how they now have buildings where the, the rooms are, they're smart rooms. And so when there's nobody in the room, the heat turns off, the AC turns off, somebody walks in and it turns in. So you probably have a little bit of an adjustment period. And I know if you've got a really big room and a lot of people, the adjustment period can be far too long and you've got to prepare ahead. I do kind of get all that. But it seems to me there are some places that have solved this better and maybe it's simply more modern equipment and better equipment and better insulated walls. I don't know. Um, but that's something that I'd be sort of a little interested in. You can toss some articles my way. Okay. No, you're, about. you're right about the building envelope. That's the key thing. Yeah. Joan. Joan has completely hammered that to me uh, through all our policy efforts. Um, but then, the, you know, we humans actually throw off quite a bit of heat. You know, the lighting systems, computers, they all throw off a lot of heat. And when you get them in mass, particularly for, you know, if you've ever gone to a, like a movie in the, in the summertime. I always take a jacket if I go. And, and anticipating a big crowd, they, they pre-cool it, anticipating a big crowd. If that big, big crowd doesn't develop, then you're cold throughout the whole movie. Right. So it's just... But, but to effectively manage a facility where you are expecting a large influx of people, a typical facility management practice is to pre-cool the building, gathering uh, yeah. spaces and so forth. So it's, there's an art and a science to this, but there, and there's, and there's um, pre-cooling and there's, um, there's transitionary temperature ranges. And I think experience. there's a culture. Because I don't know if there's anywhere else in the world that people have to make sure they have sweaters with them in the su in the hot summer months. I mean, I just, just the rest of the world I think does it a little differently. So I'd kind of like that, to look at that too. Thank you. That's part of it. Is I was also recently in Germany and I noticed the beauty of those four foot walls. What? <laughs> I think policy or certainly uh, behavioral change is a big part of this, no matter what we look at. But I will ask for privilege of a personal veto that we model that Americans change their habits towards where they're going to be comfortable from a heating and cooling perspective as a way you get from three to one or from one to zero. If that's a part of your model, this is junk science. <laughs> I will just... I am no. Americans aren't giving up. No, no, no. In a five-year period, Ms. Garvey. Uh, no, I, in a five-year... I'm just I saying... I think that's a lot to there a lo I'm not okay. saying it's all of it. I'm just saying there are a lot of tools out there, and if we had a few more reasonable... I get embarrassed when people have to come here and wear sweaters in the summertime. I, I feel that's, it. I feel let's it. put it that way. 
All right. Even though these are talented folks, I'm not sure that they can make that, mm -hmm. that shift. Oh, no, that's minutes. our job. We do the politics, right? We do it, yeah. All right. You had a question about the dashboard. I did. did you want to add that? No, answer no, I was just... The, the whole dashboard idea, yeah. if we did that more, because I know we, so you guys probably do it. Maybe we just don't see it. It's under development, and it's coming in July. Oh, so, well, ask and you shall weeks. receive. Yes. Thank you. We've, we've been working hard on it. Our GIS folks have been doing a great job. And That's we'll great. Have, um, it's in draft form and coming to you in July. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, we look forward to it. Yeah, me too. Let's remind you this so we can maybe move um, uh, this board. Next. All right, so uh, one question about just the, the broader uh, one to zero question. So, <clears throat> so I can continue to wrap my head around it. In, in, in economics, there's this second best theory that says, you know, you can't reach your optimal target. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, other ways of, of reaching that target are necessarily second best. They could create effects that are, in fact, harmful. Like, this is not a jigsaw puzzle where if one piece is removed, you just figure out the replacement piece and you're done. In this case, the replacement could actually lead you farther from where you want to be. I bring this up within the concept of offsets, other forms of achieving neutrality. And it seems to me that on some degree, um, when we come up with a plan, assuming that we're gonna fill any gap with what we know now is not necessarily the way we would want to do it several years down the road. So that's the frame at which I actually embrace the whole idea of, here is our ambitious reach to get to one, but knowing that from one to zero means just, you know, essentially paying it off or, or figuring out something is not so appealing to me because that may not necessarily be something that leads us to a, a broader, um, more sustainable world point of view. Is that, is that a fair frame to, to bring to this work? Okay, all right. I, I see where you're going. I mean, there, there is the risk of thinking, well, if we can just write a check, <laughs> we're done. And that's why the plan thus far to one has focused on reductions in Arlington that benefit Arlingtonians and economic development and energy security here. Um, but the question was raised and I mean, it is an option. The, the whole, the notion of an offset and net zero is, uh, it's, it's out there and I, I imagine that years down the road there will be more of a market. Um, so it's, it's an option. Sure, thanks. All right, Ms. If, Crystal. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Ms. McBride. If I could just, um, and again, it's not by way of excuse. Uh, currently we are at 9.1 metric tons per capita. Um, when the last, when the original CEP was adopted, it was 13, 12.9. 12 um, we're going in five years where we're looking to get our hard targets down to one. So going from where we are now to um, one is very ambitious. So I didn't want the board to think that there was a, a very small delta there between where we are and where we wanna go. The other thing to remember is that this is a CEP that goes through a new iteration every five years, and there have been dramatic changes and evolution in just the past five years, as um, Mr. Gutchell has, and you have pointed out in your introduction, we assume that necessity is going to be the mother of invention over the next five years. And Ms. Crystal, I think you have a question about a key component of getting us there, right? That's right. Literally getting us there, transportation. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> we've talked less about, tra I know, sorry, grown. If our buses only ran on puns between our manager and me, we'd, we'd have a sustainable. Um, so we, That might be the problem with our 
Oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> we you, uh, did, you did it. Right. You did it. Right. So if I, um, if I could ask, I think electrification of vehicles has come up a few times. The one that would be under our control would be the electrification of our own fleet, which is a topic we return to often um, in context of our master transportation plan and now the CEP. But if you could share with us the latest thinking uh, on uh, if that is not feasible in the next, say, 12 to 18 months, when might it be feasible? Um, what do we know about uh, the, the necessary preconditions and the opportunities that might allow us to electrify our own fleet? Okay, I may have uh, Dennis to help me out a little bit too on the art bus side and tell you a little bit more about the transit fleet. But let me just kind of give you an overview of the fleet right now. Um, we have 1,287 uh, vehicles in the fleet right now. Um, in the light vehicles, including sedans, SUVs, and light trucks, 36% or 130 of, of those vehicles are hybrid, and seven are electric. Okay, and that is a reflection of a number of things. Uh, Chris Allison has given me more information that, than I can possibly give you in a short answer. Um, but the short story is, we are trying to balance the cost with the trends in the industry and what's available to us. So that premium that we pay for an all electric vehicle um, manifests itself in, through all the departmental budgets every year. And so as we do our implementation plan, we will try to you know, give you those, some of those offerings and choices about how far you wanna go year to year. And that will be depend on the market, what's happening broadly within you know, the market of vehicles. Um, you know, I think we are all waiting for those breakthrough battery technologies that will then change the, the fundamental dynamics of affordability. Cost you know, so when we get it down to it's like it's a negligible cost difference or maybe even cost effective. Um, but we have to look beyond just the vehicles. There's that charging infrastructure that we have to invest in and I think it's about eight thousand dollars or so per. That, that was that was an installation of multiple at yeah. the trade center. So you know, if you know, let's just say I can buy a sedan. Just, even if they're about the same cost, somewhere I got to get that capital in to get the charging infrastructure, and and that's another consideration and and, and how we do this uh, and how fast we transition um, over time. If I could just add to that, um, Craig and I were talking this morning and there's really the impact of the market. Um, there's studies that are predicting that by 2028, the cost of producing an internal combustion engine car on a global production chain is going to exceed what the profitability of it is. So by the 2028, 2030, you're going to see that kind of pitching point that we're now seeing with solar. And, you know, we were talking, and obviously we want to be aggressive, um, but imagine if you would have invested in solar, whether it be on-site or PPA, 10 years ago, and the price point that you would have locked yourself into, and the available technology. Um, solar technology was at 9 to 11% efficiency back then, and today it's 27 to 29, and they're currently beta testing new technology that could reach 44 to 45%. So that market, the price point, the market saturation where really the demand starts bringing the price point down. Um, we're also trying to track that kind of entry into that market and that penetration on behalf of the county at a way that doesn't assume that we're at the, over the apex of the trajectory now in that technology. We're, we're kind of starting on the upswing now. Solar is kind of over the apex. Um, but there is planning, strategic planning that we've been talking about that we can actively take now so we don't wait until the market is there and aren't ready to take advantage. You'd like to be part of driving that demand. Yep. That brings the cost down. That's a Another fascinating pun. insight. <laughs> And so as with regard to our buses, I think we have Mr. Leach here to talk about oh, that. Oh, yeah, of course. Tag. Uh, I'm going to respond to this with a slightly broader frame. So our top-line strategy in transportation is multimodalism. 
It's the vehicle trip not taken. So households in Arlington drive less than households anywhere else in Virginia and less than anyone but basically residents in down, the downtown core. That's a huge part of why we are making that progress from 12.9 to 9.1 and traveling down ultimately to one. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of work. We are really trying to provide the maximum number of attractive, sustainable options. Uh, but across all of our portfolio of options, those options have to be reliable, attractive. Um, so when we think of transit, is that transit bus where you want it? Does it have real-time information? Can you count on it every day? And I know for Arlington and ART, as well as our work with Metro Bus and Metro Rail, these are really important things to focus on. Um, it's all of the vehicle trips not taken. We are open to electrification. Um, I will tell you, ART as a small fleet, um, it is a riskier endeavor for us uh, because of that issue of having a small fleet and needing to be reliable. Um, it is probably an easier thing for Metro with an 1,100 bus fleet um, to do it, but we are thinking about it. We continue to research the market and learn from our other um, uh, transit partners around the region, and we also look across the country uh, to look at best practices. Uh, the circulator has been experimenting with all electric. Um, the m verdict is still out in terms of reliability and their maintenance track record. Um, so I will tell you in this plan, we are very open to both electrification on the public side as well as encouraging the private side of the fleet. Um, but there are, it's, it's also balanced with needing to provide a set of options for people that focus on all of those vehicle trips not made. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely core to Arlington's land use and transportation strategy. I really appreciate that. And how many um, bus vehicles are in our art fleet? Uh, currently 75. We're less than half the size of the APS school bus fleet. That's re really interesting, and I'll uh, yield the floor, but I, I think that actually, in context of the um, nearly 1,300 vehicles in the county fleet that Mr. Emanuel described is sort of an indication of where our priorities might be too. So I appreciate that. Okay, just to recap where we are, because I think Mr. Gutschall wants to take us to the third policy question or maybe the fourth on uh, energy equity. So colleagues, we're not taking formal votes, but just to get uh, a little sense of where we are, I want to summarize, please correct me if I misstate this. Generally, there is acceptance that um, the functional plan for 1% um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, during the plan horizon versus zero is understandable, even though we generally embrace the ambitious target. We accept that this is a plan to achieve one that's functional here. Is that a misstatement of what I'm hearing? Yeah, I don't think that. I don't, yeah. That's fair. So I'd um, be having to comment I'm, on I'm, it. Yeah, not yet, not yet, not okay. yet. Okay. One, let me get a stress <laughs> test of the other ones. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, so in terms of renewables, the um, option for county government renewable by 2025, even though it differs slightly from E2C2, which desired it by 2024, understanding that it's a phased approach to achieve half in a couple of years and the rest by 2025, that generally meets with agreement, understanding that a small percentage of that is generated from on-site solar, but is achieved through contracted renewable energy. That's good? Thanks. Yep. All right. And the community goal of 20 by 100% by 2035, which I do think mirrors what might have been E2C2 suggestion, which has been affirmed by staff, as I understand it, is something that we're also comfortable with. Okay. All right. So we still have more conversation about the one to zero, but Mr. Gutschall, I think now, wanted to take us into a third area. All right. Uh, I did want to ask about the, the equity, which is um, to note, first off, that uh, objective 3.3 of our affordable housing master plan is to ensure environmental sustainable sustainability practices are incorporated into affordable housing developments. 
Um, and then 331 is encourage energy efficiency in new and renovated affordable housing. Will it be, is it reasonable to assume that part of the implementation of the CEP, when that comes to us, we'll see the implementation plan. That'll be part of the RTA. Is that correct? Is that when we'll see that? No. When will we see the implementation plan? Just in the final? Our plan was to bring the implementation plan uh, after the board adopted the CEP in September because that would provide the guidance. So if we can go to the slide with the time frame, it would be the fourth quarter of this year based on what the board would adopt in the CEP. We would take those goals and that guidance and go back and review and update the implementation plan. Okay, so when the implementation plan comes, will it be, is it reasonable to assume that there would be uh, a provision in there to, to, as part of the update of the affordable housing master plan to update some of this, to get a little more aggressive in terms of not just encourage energy efficiency, but actually to develop some tools and programs to address the split incentive, for example, where you have uh, oftentimes the owners of the buildings are not the ones who are paying the utility bills, therefore they don't have the incentive right now uh, to make these kinds of improvements. So when will, when will we get sort of heavy on that very important issue? Um. Oops, I'm going to let Rich pick this up. Very quickly, I just wanted to add that Joan and Jessica Aberlin have been working very closely with affordable housing for quite some time. So there are already standards and already incentives that are put in place for ensuring that there's a kind of higher level than the state funding requires for, so that's for energy new, efficiency. new affordable housing units, right? New committed that come through our... New, our new affordable housing all of the, the new site plan ones have baseline energy efficiency as part of the state requirements, and then we add on top of that as well. Right, and, and do we, will it be part of our implementation, though, to start to get into existing housing stock that may not be yes. slated for redevelopment? There will be implementation items that directly, and you, the split incentive is a, key, is a key component of that. That rental market is really tough to crack, and the split incentive is a, is a good place to get started, green leasing, for example. Um, financing programs, potentially PACE, can be used for some of those projects um, as a financing mechanism. All of, that, all of that needs to be looked at for existing, to get the existing ones to be more energy efficient. OK. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's, to me, on, on the equity issue as it relates to this, I mean, mm -hmm. this is really an interesting dilemma that we face, is the way that I see it, because we know uh, very well that uh, those who will most feel the negative impacts of climate change are low income and, and the disenfranchised. On the other hand, we also know that they are the ones that, uh, that are least able to bring about the change that we need, and, and we need to make sure that as we move forward with implementation of this community energy plan, that we're not putting it on on their backs, that we have to figure out how to do this in a way that, that has some equity to it. So not doing anything is certainly not an option, and how we do it is very, very important. So I, I will be very interested to hear more details as we start to flush out how we're going to, uh, to, to get into the nitty gritty of the split incentive and, and other factors as well. Yeah. May I quickly ask a clarifying question? Because we started out um, specifically identifying affordable housing, and particularly in Arlington, with the cost of real estate, I, I, I wanted to ask when we talk about equity, are we including in affordable housing, we're also including low to moderate income, disadvantaged and underserved communities? Yeah, all of the above. Thank you for asking that, Dimitri, because I think it's, as I was reading that objective of the affordable housing master plan, it actually uh, reminded me, as I think we've dis all discussed previously, that what we really need, then I think the next version of the affordable housing master plan will just be a housing master plan. It's really housing. The point of affordable is, it's moot almost at this point. <laughs> so it's housing across the board and, and I think f at all levels we need to address the energy equity. Indeed. All right, Ms. Garvey, Mr. DeFranti. 
Okay. It's crystal. And then I would just remind us all, since we do have to wrap ourselves around the central first policy question that was raised, we should try to make sure we get there before we're duly slated to end at around five. Okay. Um, it's sort of on equity, but it's back to transportation. Transportation and equity being kind of really rolled into one. If people are gonna be able to afford to live here, if they could get around cheaply, it would be really good. Um, so what's ha what are you hearing happened with the VW suit that we were supposed to be seeing in Northern Virginia, all of these charging stations? Um, do we have, a, so I'm wondering about that, do we have a plan for where charging stations should go when we get them? Because I understand, you know, just some of our counterparts overseas, they, they, they're sort of working out a plan, even they don't have them yet, they know where they need to be kind of located. And are we looking at um, pilots? Um, this company, Ubitricity, is apparently in New York City doing a pilot, and it would be great to have had them maybe here doing a pilot, which is uh, having electricity on, on light poles, that you can have charging stations on light poles is what they're looking at. Um, and we have on Fort Myer this incredible, um, it's, you might call it a bus, but it's not, and the reason I kind of like it is it's, it's electric, it's autonomous, it's a vehicle, but it doesn't look like a bus. It looks like something different. It's manufactured differently, it's conceived differently, it's totally different, and I feel like that may be where we need to go for transportation here, rather than buses that, you know, just making buses that they look like buses, but they run differently. It's a little bit like horseless carriages. You remember when, when they took the horses away and they still look like carriages, even though there weren't any horses there? And now we're finally getting, so I'm wondering if that, so those, that's a lot rolled into kind of one question, but it all comes down to electric vehicles. I think, when are we gonna get them? What are, what are our plans to make sure that they, um, charging is universally available or all around the county? That gets an equity thing. Um, and any thoughts you have on that? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer some of those questions. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, the, uh, doing a, a comprehensive electric vehicle infrastructure needs assessment and plan is something that's on our um, wish list and, and to-do list for implementation. Um, the Volkswagen money has been um, slow to deploy. The... Um, there's some monies that have been uh, identified as being to be available for, for uh, local metro regions, but it hasn't been released or defined yet. Uh, there have been monies that have been distributed to, to the individual states, and the state of Virginia has uh, issued a contract, I think it was about $84 million, to one firm to put high-speed charging um, in metro areas and we've been speaking with them and we've identified a couple of attractive sites uh, on county property uh, for use by the public and that's in um, uh, risk management and the, it, it's an agreement that's pending. Um, Electrify America is a subsidiary of Volkswagen and it's where Volkswagen put a lot of money into its own uh, shop, so to speak, to uh, uh, install high-speed charges up and down the interstates so that people can travel with electric vehicles easily. Um, that has slowly begun being deployed in Virginia. So the, we, we want to identify uh, the most attractive areas for charging. There, there are already 40-odd um, EV charging stations that are public in Arlington. Uh, they tend to be at shopping centers, um, a couple of county facilities, the um, office buildings, garages. Um, and so we're looking, we, we, we also want to plan so that we don't necessarily put too much money into a certain type of charging if the charging technology moves in a way that in 10 years, uh, you know, you, you drive over the charger and boom, you're done. Uh, you know, so so there's a, it, we're approaching it thoughtfully. Thank you. It's that wave problem again. Got it. All right. So just because of time, I'm going to ask good. that you. if you have any requests for information, certainly surface those today so that staff can follow up. But um, let's each of us give some signal of where we are uh, with the central question uh, that we have before us today. If you have any questions to help get us there, please ask those now. Matt? Yeah, so I don't have any. Ranty, sorry. No worries. Uh, I don't have actually have any 
uh, questions. Um, Are you ready to weigh in on that central question? That's what I was okay, going to go great. ahead and do, uh, follow up on a couple of the other things on equity. Um, but um, I think that there's a, Arlington has such a history of leading on climate and energy. Um, and I think the details on what DC is doing, they, they do have some different structures. I very much hope we don't have to get to a place, but there is a provision in the Virginia Code for uh, your own utility if if things don't move forward, you know, um, and that's I'll just say that that but but first and foremost you see Montgomery Cl County just passed based on a year's worth of evidence an update to their uh, greenhouse gas emissions and it's 100 percent by 2050 and initi quote initiating large-scale efforts to remove excess carbon from the atmosphere. I don't think it's just DC, but I think it's Montgomery County as well that is pushing beyond where we are. And I think um, we have to reach for that. Uh, and that's why I think zero as opposed to one is critical. I would also just note that while I don't think we should just assume we can buy our way from one to zero, I do think that the biggest central issues that we face are income inequality and climate change as a country. And those are linked. And we have to be ready to invest for those who have the most or are best able to invest so that we can help with the equity question that is a piece of the long study of um, environmental economics. And so that's why I'm for zero as opposed to one. Okay, Ms. Garvey. So the question is, we're at three right now per capita, three metric tons per capita for carbon, and we want to get to... That's the goal. And the, the goal, goal is three. The goal is three. We're and at we'd like nine. To make, that's right. Yes, thank you. But the goal is at three. And, we're gonna, and we'd like to get the goal to one, and then there is a suggestion that we should just say zero. Um, is that, that the question? So I make sure I understand it. Uh, so I... <laughs> I, you know, I've been through this with schools and everything. You get you get beat up if you don't say zero. What kind of an aspiration is it? What are dreams made for? Et cetera, et cetera. However, I really think it's important to be honest with our public and honest with ourselves. And right now, we know how. We've got a good idea how we can get to one, which is half of the under two coalition, this global coalition that's working. So it's still a really, really ambitious, um, ambitious goal. Um, and I'm comfortable with that, assuming that we'll be back at this, or maybe not me, but some of us will be back at this table in another five years or so, um, and maybe we'll get it down to zero, but we'll be honest about how we're going to get there. Um, so I like to be aspirational. One feels aspirational. It feels like a big, uh, a really good step. It doesn't mean we don't want to get to zero. It just means that we're being honest. That we know how we can get to one. We think we know how we can do it. We're not sure how we can get to zero yet. So I don't like to promise things that I can't do. I think we will get there. Um, so, but I'm not going to fall on my sword about it because I know sometimes you push, you say it's zero, and then we do all kinds of things to try to get there. I do thought, think, uh, Mr. Chair, that you made a good point. Are we going to do all of these things to get there that actually maybe are a little counterproductive just because we want to get there? Um, and I've seen that happen before, too, and I don't think that's so healthy either. So if my chair's at one, I'm at one with him. All right. Thank you. Ms. Crystal. Great. So just wanted to quickly weigh in on the equity question. Um, how do we effectively address it? Uh, this is a maybe a greater than um, just the community energy plan, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. And this really came to the fore for me during our conversation recently at a board meeting about accessory dwellings. Um, and I think Mr. Leach actually characterized it well when he talked about we have the kind of community and we've created the kind of community where people can get around without vehicles. And we know nationally that the greatest driver overall of climate change is sprawl. Uh, and when I think about the, the kind of Venn diagram, if you have equity, equity is one bubble, climate action is another, and local government at the third, the thing that is actually in the center is land use, land use, and land use. I mean, that is what we have unique control control over. Um, uh, I think that it's absolutely fitting and right, and I'm excited about uh, the specific uh, goals to actually you know, reduce our own footprint uh, in all of these sectors. But ultimately, the, the one uh, um, set of decisions or plane where we have the most and only influence as a local government is in enabling people to live close to job centers by not excessively constraining the housing supply. Uh, and so I just really wanted to emphasize that. I don't know how or if that gets written into the CEP, but um, in terms of kind of political leadership and while we've got some great advocates out with us in the community, um, 
I hope we don't lose sight of that because for me, marrying equity to climate action to, to the place where we have the most influence of local government, you know, there, there is nothing more impactful uh, than, than enabling people to live close to job centers, people at all economic ladders, the steps of the ladder. So that's my thought on equity. Um, with regard to the central question, uh, um, good points raised throughout, and I really appreciate staff's answer and uh, the, the um, candor yet diplomacy with which you suggested maybe one of the things that maybe differentiates us from other communities that have adopted zero is that we don't take on goals that we can't substantiate. Um, nevertheless, someone made the comment and, and they said, well, it's a little bit more of a political goal. Um, and I think that's right, but I, I actually think uh, as pejorative in our current day as the political, you know, as a characterization is, there actually is a value in political goals and and I think that's what we're here for um, it's us to, to, to issue a call to our community um, I don't want to do anything that is irresponsible and I really appreciate the point uh, that has been made throughout the day about how aggressive non slacking even the one metric ton per capita goal is um, but nevertheless I, I think there is a political role for us here uh, in in staking out a goal of trying to get to zero um, and I appreciate the work staff has done even just for this briefing and to the extent we can do more of it with the CP itself to talk about what assumptions and maybe even the extent to which we're a little uncomfortable with some of those assumptions what needs to change if it's zero with an asterisk I'm okay with that too right these are the the um, state enabling authorities that we need or the way the markets need to proceed and without those changes we, we honestly can't get there um, but I but I am inclined to see the political value that we can add as the board of saying that we are going to aim for zero um, and the only other point I wanted to make was just I, I think with regard to the offsets I agree about proceeding with caution uh, you know towards a strategy that could lead us to sort of putting more cash towards the problem um, you know given our our we are a wealthy community, yet we do have budget constraints, and, and you know there will be trade-offs at the point of every budget. However, I don't actually see those offsets as simply kind of throwing money out the window with regard to our climate goals, because if we as a community are purchasing offsets, we are helping hasten the outcome of a more mature and stable carbon market. Uh, we are buyers in that market. And so I think there's some value. I want us to get to uh, that, that zero emissions goal um, through our actions and improvements and activities first and foremost. But I don't see uh, you know, having to consider offsets as um, a, a, a useless action. I think it does further national and international climate goals in and of itself too. So that's, that's my piece on the matter. Mr. Gutschall. Extraordinarily well said, Ms. Crystal. Um, and in particular, the point about that uh, buying down, if you will, the last, uh, the last metric ton of, of CO is, is to me is not, shouldn't be viewed so negatively. It's not thrown. When we talked about the rule of unintended consequences and how you might be doing things, that's exactly how you avoid that when you have the opportunity all along the way. And this is not just in some theoretical future year. All along the way, we should be looking at uh, what is the most cost-effective way to reduce it? And it's not always going to be to put solar on top of this building. It might be to buy solar somewhere else, and it might not all. And it's not going to necessarily be to try to uh, remove our natural gas infrastructure uh, for cooking and heating everywhere. It's going to be to make sure that those are uh, very efficient homes that are being heated, so you need less of it. But you might still use gas, but then you offset that. So it's not. It's not a negative. It's a negative if you only rely on that, and I think that's the point that you made, but I wanted to underscore that's very, very important. I will just, obviously the direction, I think, no surprise to anyone, right? The direction here where I'm headed is, is uh, I, I frankly could not really imagine that we would have a C C e uh, CEP in this point in time where we are, where we have, uh, and I think everyone at this table can agree, and in this room, I imagine, can agree that we have an emerging consensus around the, uh, the, the 2018 IPCC report that made very, very clear uh, in order to stay uh, within, to have a chance at keeping global warming to a net rise of one and a half degrees. And by the way, Ms. Garvey, I think under two means to stay under two degrees, not under two metric tons. Um, and so uh, to, in order to stay under that, that, you, that we uh, have to, the models show that we have to um, reach carbon neutral by 2050. I think you're seeing a proliferation of adoption of that goal. 
uh, which was the point I tried to make earlier, that even though in, in the table that we had, and it's changing rapidly, and other cities are coming online. So if we, Ms. Crystal described it as being, you know, as, as exhibiting political leadership, I believe that we have built this community on, it's not just political leadership, it is moral leadership, there's a moral imperative here, there is an equity imperative, there is a survivability, there is a resilience imperative. Every aspect of what we value about this community comes down to that we have to address this threat head on. And I think the only way that we do that with having any, uh, being able to hold on to any claim of legitimate leadership is that we have to adopt this goal. So it's not a hollow goal for me, it would not be. I would expect that we are the community that can have this goal and have the data and the charts behind it that show, yes, it's aggressive, but we're gonna get there. And by doing that, that's how we enable our, our, our regional partners, our, the state, nationally, everybody else to also do their parts to chip in so it's not all on our shoulders. And then we will find that rapid progression of the technological advances and the economics all start to fall into place where it's actually not gonna be quite as hard as we might fear today at this table. So I'm unequivocally for zero. Thank you. I hope to, yeah. Could I, I can count where we are on this goal to yeah. zero, but I just wanted to say if we do this, and I, I'm not, I'm really pleased that we've got the implementation coming up and the dashboard, because what we need to do to be totally honest with our community is we need to show out and have this dashboard we come up with every year so we know how we're doing. Um, and I think that is really important. So it's great to have this, this goal and aspiration. I think we need to show how we're getting there, um, and I'm comfortable enough doing it, um, setting it as zero, but I really want that dashboard out there so that we keep track of it every year. I can count to zero as well, but that's not gonna stop me from saying what, I, what it is yeah, I wanna sorry. say on the issue. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the privileges of having the gavel. You know, I will say that, uh, you know, for all of us, none of us differ about where we'd ultimately like to see our, our world go. We'd all like to get um, to zero metric tons in actuality, not just in neutrality, by 2030. I, you know, I, I'd like to get there. I, I want our world to get there, actually technologically, with the right policy levers from the federal level, state on down, it is technically feasible to reach these goals much faster than even our ambitious plan in any iteration would realize. I would love for that to happen. Uh, the question becomes, what, what does our plan do? And while I am mindful that um, <clears throat> the notion of, of carbon neutrality as a political goal makes every sense, as a moral goal, it makes every sense, I, I am somewhat uh, still thinking about this issue of you know, what happens when we think about this whole idea that, that offsets and leading to our, while it's been said that that's never a bad thing, in fact, that's not necessarily true. We don't know how the market is going to evolve in such a way that, for example, offsets become um, the better play for a municipality than actually doing some of the real work to actually really drive down um, emissions. Uh, we don't know whether or not it's gonna create further inequalities between wealthier communities and individuals within communities or not. There are scenarios which could play out where those could create consequences that I don't think necessarily would be acceptable. So I'm not willing at this point to say, well, let's do the best we can and offsets are always gonna be the second best policy option. I don't know if we can substantially say that that will be true 100% of the way today. And that in many ways leads me to, to really embracing the whole idea that this plan is ridiculously ambitious and we give it a little bit of short shrift having this conversation about one to zero as if it's a minor thing. Going from, not, from nine to one is huge. It's huge. We, we need to let that foment and germinate for a little bit. This is an ambitious plan. Um, it is certainly wonderful if we could get to zero. That would make us feel great. Uh, but the order of magnitude of its ambition is there already. So uh, for me, uh, having at least our staff seeing a path that can be pursued, that we can evaluate them and evaluate ourselves with one as the ultimate 
um, the ultimate baseline is, is one that I'm, I'm comfortable with because it is a substantial improvement. I do have a worry about uh, a largely political goal working its way into an implementation plan that again, we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to. But I trust that we can figure out and how to frame it and how to discuss it, that we recognize um, that we will rely on the best modeling and expertise and, and, and levers of power that we have in order to implement as best we can, recognizing that on some level, um, the zero is just something that we wanna keep as our North Star and not move away from. So hopefully we can figure out how to do all that. I can ultimately get comfortable with it because again, this is largely a, a wonky disagreement, but we have to make sure, I think, um, that we give our staff the appropriate uh, guidance so that we don't leave ourselves in the situation that Mr. Emanuel described earlier where staff go, yeah, we don't know how we're gonna do this, but that's what the, that's what the political people say. I think Arlington is better than that, so um, anyway. You've heard it all. You know where the votes are, even though there are no votes. <laughs> You'll figure out how to make it happen. Mr. DeFerranti? Just really quickly, I think it's fair to say that I'd love a briefing on, on z the underlying zero, what the assumptions are. That's my instinct. That's my strong preference. That's where I'll be in a month. But um, we've got the RTA in July. I, I do think some clarifying uh, briefing would really help me, and I'm, I'm guessing maybe a few of the rest of us on, on that, on the, on the zero and all the, what it means. Very quickly, Mr. Chair, just, yeah. just on that, uh, would we then advertise, would we advertise the options or are we looking at now that the direction is that we're just gonna advertise zero? I don't, so I would suspect we could ask our county yeah. attorney, but generally when we've this is uh, advertised comp plan elements, yeah. the, the, uh, the, the element itself is not uh, up for wordsmithing yeah. as part of I know I know from a legal stamp there's not an issue of scope on the advertisement legally but I think I think we have on policy documents sometimes if there was still still some open question of what the asterisk is and I'm not trying to <laughs> unwind what just happened I'll go I'll go I just was we, we got it it's zero. The document will be, they'll produce a draft that's responsive to this conversation, and if we need to further perfect it when it comes before us, we can. All right. Seeing nothing else, thank you all very much. We're adjourned. Thank you.